I, I love traveling, meeting new people, see, hanging out with friends, eating good food. And I found a lifestyle that allows me to do that and make a buck at the same time and getting to know your people that will get you to that next level. But it's not, what I would argue is that the margins get too high, right? If you're you know well beyond 25%, Imagine what you could do for your clients with that extra dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, we got a legend for you guys today. This is a dear friend of mine who's probably the smartest, uh, most badass agency owner I know, Seth Price. And just so you guys know a little bit about Seth, uh, cheers for that is Seth is one of those guys, by the way, they could be on the Inc 5000 fastest growing. He actually has a, a giant law firm in DC, as well as a, a super awesome, successful um, SEO agency. And they could be on the Inc 5000 list every year if they wanted to be. But you, for the most part, you just don't always fill out the paperwork to actually get on the list. Um, we, we finally started doing it for the agency. Yeah, I, I, literally back in the day, I was like, why would I pay $500 for this? And then it became a thing. <laughs> So first of all, Seth, thank you so much for uh, being here. I know you got uh, a lot going on and, uh, you know, you're um, you're a player. You make stuff happen. I would love to hear, actually, just if you're open to it, sharing a little bit about your philosophy for getting clients. Because um, a lot of people, when they, they come to me, there's all these built-in assumptions about things they have to do. So everybody's told them they got to have you know this and the website and they got to do this and they got to contact this many people and do those things. But um for the most part, as an agency owner, or are you talking about as, a, as an end user? Yeah, I mean, I th I think uh, as an agency owner. No, as an agent, look, so an agency owner, the accidental agency in a lot of ways. I mean, I met you in the legal space back in the day. And, you know, basically I was running a law firm and doing the digital myself because I didn't see anybody out there that I loved how they did it. And, you know, my team internally over better part of a decade started to want opportunities that I couldn't give them as an in-house person. When you're in-house, you sort of limitations on what you're willing to pay because it's coming off the bottom line. Um, and realized, you know, I could replicate what I did for Price Benowitz for law firms, which, you know, started with one or two, now several hundred around the country. So I think at the end of the day, and I tell this to people, whether it's a job interview or whether it's digital agency, if you solve somebody's problem, you'll make money. So if somebody needs clients as an end user, as the law firm, as the plumber, as the anything, and you're able to put clients in their lap, you're going to end up making money because they're going to pay you to solve their problem of needing clients. No different than when I talk to people who need a job, where I'm like, look, it's one thing to say, hey, I need a job. But the other is, hey, I'm going to solve your problem. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z that's going to make you money. People are going to listen as an employer. Similarly, if you are an agency and you want to sell into a market, the question is, what is their issue? Can you get them people to find them who've never heard of them before? Is it something where they need to be positioned so that their reputation is good despite nonsense going on at the firm? Whatever it is, your job is to figure out their pain point and solve for that. And if you do that, you'll be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking about that. That's one of the things I, I love about you because as as you mentioned, like we, you know, we've been to a lot of conferences and stuff together and, and many times spoken on the same stages. And some of those speakers are like super charismatic and they're like it to me, like a, not that you're not charismatic, but they're they're like a Tony Robbins hype event, or you know, where they're like, and you are very much like nuts and bolts, like solving problems. Here's here's what matters to Google, here's how to stay um top of mind. And I think it, it's really, really useful for the folks that in some ways are like introverts that think like, oh, I have to like, you know, be this jacked up. I'm gonna grow your business, blah, blah, blah. And you very much really just talk about exactly like you just described, which I've seen you do probably 50 times, is just like these are the problems. This is how we're solving them. This is what's working. This is what you need to do. Here's a checklist from start to finish. And if you want my help, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts just on, on how you like. Put no, that I mean, look, I, I think you, you've summarized something that I, that I believe in deeply, which is you got to be yourself. We all do what we like to do. You found a way to make a living, hang out with your kids and live in paradise. Right. I mean, that's yeah. not nothing. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You know, everybody. I, I love traveling, meeting new people, see, hanging out with friends, eating good food. And I found a lifestyle that allows me to do that and make a buck at the same time. Yeah. So. You know, there are people that are rah-rah. That is not me. In fact, it's always the sizzle that scares me. 
because I'm like, if that sizzle is there, what am I being distracted from? Yeah, totally. And so to me, like, I think you dance with what you got. If you're great at sizzle, do sizzle. There's money to be made there. If you're great at substance, there's it's great there. If you're able to put together a portfolio of, of, of organizations and assets that allow you to work from the beach with your family, then, then do it. I think if you if you go into the lane that you're genuine with, you're going to do a lot better than if you try to pretend you're something you're not. I mean, people can see something's disingenuous from a mile away. So if I tried to be Mr. Hype Man, I don't think it's going to work. And I think people would see through it yeah. um, that I that I sort of like go with the idea that for me, like when I go to a conference, my when I go and I go to a lot of conferences, I met you at a conference way back, but I'm looking at what takeaways do I get? What have I learned that's going to make me better? Similar to what I just talked about. Yeah. What, what are the takeaways that I can bring to back to my office and make money? If I have those, it's a successful conference. My rule, write down everything I've met and saw at a conference, circle the ideas or star them, make a list of 10 on the plane, which three are you going to hit short term, three medium term, and four may need to wait. And by doing that, I feel like it's similar to, as an agency owner, figuring out what is that zone. Um, I just saw something really cool um, at, with Josh Nelson's um, uh, conference where there was a guy who had figured out in the lawn care space how to do, I think, more than just digital marketing, but actually essentially act as a business consultant for upsells, for retargeting, for um, looking at prospects in a whole different way than just, hey, the prospects are there, good luck. And to me, this guy... I think was one third SEO or digital marketer and two thirds business ops runner. But like, if he came to those people and said, I'm going to sell you a consultancy, they'd run the other way. But if he says, Hey, I'm going to get you digital marketing and this is my methodology and follow these rules. He is so good and so convincing. I'm like, Hey, where do I sign up? I mean, it was, it, so the idea is figure out what you have as that skill or, and passion and then put that together in a way that the audience sees adds value. Because if this guy just said, hey, I'm doing your marketing, he's charging way outside market rates. But the way he has packaged it and bundled it with all these other areas, I'm like, it was genius because he's figured out that it's not just about getting the phone to ring, but what do you do with that when it rings? Obviously, we know that from the legal space, but secondarily, he, you know, taking the email list of all the customers and sending them options for upsells, I thought was genius. And the fact that he's taking advantage of that to show the life cycle of the marketing rather than just in the front door, but once in the front door, what do you do to get beyond it? I, it to me, that's next level. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I don't know why, but you just gave me a laugh because you were the one who actually told me um, that you have as a number, if somebody fills out an email form, you got three minutes to get back to him. I don't know if that was you or Ken, but I remember you said uh, you were experimenting with sending somebody referral who had gotten referrals their whole life. And it was a live lead from Google and they called them like they got a Friday afternoon call them back. Oh, that was my dad. That was my dad. Uh, my dad's a lawyer in New York and I sent him a, uh, a referral. I think it was a criminal case. He doesn't do criminal, but one of his colleagues and Friday at four o'clock, I said to him and shockingly Monday at 10 AM, the person was not in need of legal services anymore. Yeah. It's, it's instant gratification. And look, we all have access to, you know, inexpensive overseas labor um, and SaaS based products. There should be immediate email re replies asking what somebody needs with immediately starting a conversation, making sure you further it. Look, the, the calendarly concept has moved us in so many, we use it personally every day. And the yeah. idea that you go to instant gratification, you will get help at this appointed time. That's a game changer in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit. Too I just came up with an idea. You just gave me something. Good. I'm I just glad, got it. I'm glad. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, I've, I've actually had a few of like, lawyer clients who've been to your practice and say like they love it it's like a, to them it's like a boiler room but it's really it's not a boiler room because not like you guys are hard selling stocks it's just that you have well, availability because you know that if you call people back an hour later six hours later uh whatever yeah. it's like there's no more they've already found another law firm so you know, like that funny, I wanna... and, sorry yeah, go ahead I'll just, I'll just, before I move on you know that boiler room which was my intake room ironically is no more it's sad it's a sign of the times we went from 12 people in-house to 24 people around the country and around the globe you know for about the same budget and the idea being that we no longer have that and in some senses i miss it but in some senses all the all the workplace drama gone it's yeah. really amazing 
yeah. how there are pieces. And like, don't get me wrong. Our agency is now a hybrid. We were fully in-house and now we have a clubhouse with a lot of people working remotely um, yeah. and it's challenging. And I think there's some huge negatives to it, but there are some huge positives. When you get those eight players and they're able to work in isolation, they can do some amazing things. Yeah, that that's wild to me, especially too, because I, I was listening to a guy named John Jonas about 16 years ago who was saying like, you can hire Filipinos and like you can have virtual assistants. And I was all aboard that train. And it's really interesting for me is like, I've told a few lawyers about this five or six years ago and didn't really get received so well. And then all of a sudden in the last three years, I've had like an influx of clients who are suddenly like gone completely remote as you have done. I'd love to talk to you a little well, bit about but, but, but COVID did it. I mean, look, if you're in a blue state, we didn't have a choice. COVID yeah. was real in blue states. We were DC, the government's still not back to work. There's nobody downtown on a given workday in DC. Yeah. The world has changed. And yeah. if I want to get a person to DC, this is the other piece, which works for both the law firm and the agency, which is, when I force people in an urban environment, if you're in Columbus, Ohio, I don't I'm just make that as a location, you know, people can commute and park at the building. Great. For somebody to come to our old office, you'd pay for parking. Like they, they pay for a metro, they'd commute 30 to hour or more. But the average commute was 45 minutes plus. Yeah, we just gave totally. everybody an, an hour and a half a day back of their lives. The, no, no cost. And all of a sudden, just by going virtual, there's a raise. Now, look, is, are people speeding rules and doing all sorts of nonsense? I'm sure. But they were doing it in the office, too. Yeah. So, you know, we have, back in the day when I first started the agency, there were guys trading Adderall in the back room. I mean, wow. you know, crazy. <laughs> so, look, I, I, now they're just trading Adderall at home, not in my office. So it's only them that's affected, not the other three people they're giving it to. Yeah. You know, it would help us. That's wild. Adderall back room. I'm going to remember that. Um it kind of reminds me of what Michael Mogul said about uh, like once he built his team, he he found like as they were growing too fast, like he had team and staff leaving. And he said, uh, so he decided to like have a sponsored lunch just to take one of those things, thinking it would make everything better because he would show his team he appreciated them. And instead, all of a sudden, like this person's got a peanut allergy and then this person over here can't eat seafood and you oh, know, I, so I need to, you know what? Two things. I, I, I have not heard that story, but Michael and I chat late night a lot during billing of our businesses. And, uh, you know, th that business mind is second to none. It's really pretty amazing. Um, and I, I, it is a business saying a book that I have not written, but someday Frankie will help me produce. Um, and it's a number of truisms, which is, uh, you know, um, and one, one of those truisms is no good deed goes unpunished. And that goes under that, right. Yeah. You know, you know, you can't teach common sense and, uh, you know, money solves almost every problem or some of my, my axioms that I, that I go by, but, uh, you know, I could see that, you know, you're so excited to have a meal and all of a sudden it's like, are you paying for parking? What, what about my peanut allergy? What about this? Yeah. And then, look, they're all real things, but like, you don't deal with those otherwise. Um, yeah. so look, it, and it's, it is those things and getting to know your people that will get you to that next level, but it's not easy. We did a, client appreciation event and just getting butts and seats we did our new radio station sponsor clients lawyers getting butts and seats not easy yeah. it takes there's a lot of effort that goes people a lot of stuff going on we think a lot of ourselves we think of a lot of our law firm i wanted to get butts and seats to have this client appreciation dinner and you know what a lot less people showed than you know it was a full room but that included dates and law firm people and all sorts of other stuff but it's it's a lot of effort to do those things and to do yeah. it right. People are appreciative. I'll, I'll segue for a minute. I'm going to uh, share a story. We were planning our firm. We do uh, two to two twice a year, at least. We do firm all hands on deck meetings called agency day. And we were doing, what should we do at, on the night between the first and second day? And we, you know, the day is filled with breakout groups and team building activities and we had a choice for almost the same price point of doing an activity like ping pong at a luxury ping pong place, if that exists, right? There's ball boys, there's That's gourmet wild. drinks, there's food, but food's, you know, deluxe chicken fingers. It's not like it's gourmet food, you know, that top golf, right? You know, top golf, I'm sure. Yeah. And then the final one being dinner at one of the nicest locations in the city, in my opinion, Joe Stone Crab is a licensee in DC. And to me, a beautiful dinner of appreciation in a place that most people would only go if somebody else was paying, you know, would be like amazing. And we would show us, we have an awards ceremony. We do all these things. We really cool. 
Um, and the the uh, conventional wisdom was no activity, keep people doing stuff, which to me is why the top golfs of this world and the escape rooms and the axe throwers are doing so well, because you don't want to sit around at a table stuck there. I get that. But you, I also wanted to show deeply my appreciation and do something over the top, which price-wise isn't even over the top compared to these other things because these activities get it and they really charge significantly for that when you're getting chicken wings or some like C-grade fajitas. Um, but that's, it's just interesting how what my thought, I'm sure it's similar to the Michael story, what he thought would be really important to people probably wasn't as much yeah. as what people actually wanted, which was, do something care carefree rather than sitting down at a dinner. Yeah. Um, I know we've got a couple minutes left here, so I wanted to switch gears just a little bit, talk to you about kind of like what is what does operation setup look at like your level? I don't I don't want to like throw out some money numbers because I don't think you're just like about that, but like like Seth, as you mentioned, has hundreds of clients across the country and they're doing uh they're not your five hundred dollar a month SEO shop, like they're a premium solution. And what what does that look like for you to fulfill on that? Because I know it's probably you, you you make it look easier than it is, and I'm sure there's lots of challenges. But well, I'd love look, to hear just people a lot smarter and more organized than me and my ADHD silliness that that actually do the execution. But we have built our SEO model on fundamentals. I, as long as you've known me, I've talked about them. We have pillars: content, an entire team of content; links, an entire team of links and PR; local, entire team just doing local. And paid, entire team doing paid. You know, we have all and and technical, the building of the websites and optimizing. And it's two steps forward, one step back. You know, I, I was humble enough to realize I had a quality control issue on stuff that dev was, you know, putting on pages and getting it back. I just had to like go to the mat and say, look, this is not, this is not where I want it to be. And a lot of it is money. You know, as you scale a business, I think one of the things, my piece of advice to people is, and I, you know, you go to these meetings and you see guys who are starting out and they're, they break seven figures. Like, man, I'm, I'm, I have 40% margins. That's awesome. Good for you. What I would argue is if the margins get too high, right? If you're, you know, well beyond 25%, imagine what you could do for your clients with that extra dollars that would provide insane value and build you on that on ramp. And I think that that has been one of the secrets to success, which is we didn't sort of take a ton off the table as we were growing. We yeah. made sure we made the next hire, which means your numbers are not quite as good because you're basically, you know, you're hiring before you need people because if you wait too long, you're going to be stuck with lack of quality for your people. And so I think it's not that I want to see no margins. I want people to make a good living and and and, and hit those in five thousand uh numbers but i think the way you do get that top line revenue to grow is by providing amazing service and when you when you do allow your margins to grow that can be one of the downsides and i'm very conscious of that and so it's a very odd uh reverse relationship i have with our president david Breton. he's very much like hey i want to see that want to see great margins academically and i'm like no if we see that margin get too high that means that we're not providing the best possible service because there's something more we could do. And we're not like saying you shouldn't make any money, but when you see those margins spike very often, issues come thereafter. And so I'm very cognizant of not allowing there to be too much of a delta uh, in spiking those and instead making sure that as our revenue grows, we're continuously investing to build for the next generation of clients. Yeah. I think that's counterintuitive to what most people would think because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're thinking longevity where everybody else is just trying to keep as much as they can in the short term. And you're saying, hey, the longer we can keep clients happy, the better we can do for them, the more extravagant and amazing and like results yeah. we can give them. And then the service and the the little human touches we do on top of that, the longer we're going to be in business. And even though, yeah, our margins well, are well, smaller today, you well, know, understood. But I think you're what you're saying, which we're talking about what we're talking here. So Josh Nelson, right? His first book was on how to build an agency. I thought it was genius. If anybody's starting an agency and you're, you know, you're starting out, you're, you're trying to get to a million dollars. This guy is, I think, one of the best roadmaps I've seen for the person out of the box to get an agency going. But that said, the next step is, and if you looked at his second book, it's on churn. How do you reduce churn, right? 
And one of the ways you do that is providing the resources, hiring the right people, having the right processes in place. That takes money and resources. So not allowing yourself to get too far away, I think is really important. So one of the things I've always respected about you is you've been very lean so that so much of what you do can go to your personal clients. And to me, you know, if you had a big fancy office where you lived and tons of staff in-house, you've, you've done stuff in a way that allows you to stay very lean, which gives more resources for you to provide to your clients. Yeah. Appreciate that, my man. I'm I'm not going to keep you because I know you got to go at the top of the hour, but I just want to say thank you. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Recorded, not recorded. And uh, I know I just dig you, my man. Yeah, no, it's a, a great, you're a, a great spirit. I'm glad to have you in my life in any way, shape or form. And my aspiration and dream is to get my butt and my family to join yes. you on the beach. So we get to hang out for even a limited period of time. Ah, now we're talking. Thanks, my man. Hey, guys, if you like this video, you'll probably also like our free Facebook group, Beyond Agency Profits, Agency Lifestyle Design. Uh, you can get free copies of the book inside here. It's, I look ridiculous. We're doing weekly Q&As, giving answers to all your questions, some of the best, smartest, brightest people. We've got lots of industry leaders doing seven, eight figures and beyond. It's a literal who's who of the brightest uh, agency owners that I know, as well as lots of tips on scaling and stuff, books that work. So if you're not already part of it, uh, you're going to want to be part of it. So make sure to click the link. I put it in the description of the video, as well as in the pinned top comment below. So just scroll down and you can join and it's totally free.